And there's a lot of misunderstanding in the lay community about what's meant by uncertainty when scientists use the term. And uh, actually, several of us went to a very interesting talk about that uh, this fall, where Don Bosch from the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science talked about it. There's this feeling that if scientists say they're not certain about something, it means that they're um, unknowing or ignorant about something. And that's not um, the way the term is used at all. It simply means that we don't have the ability to know the facts or predict the processes, i.e., what's going on precisely. We know uh, something about what's going on. We just don't know everything, I think, is probably a good way to think of this. So it's our inability to know facts exactly or to predict processes uh, precisely. And I would like us to think about these two sources of nutrients. Uh, one is a 50-pound bag of urea with a label 4600. And the um, di diagram or the graphic on the right is showing a um, manure pile. And I'd like you to weigh in on which of these products you think might be less certain in terms of your knowledge of it compared to the other. So here's an opportunity and your first opportunity during this session to use the little chat box down below. Of which of these two nutrient sources are you more uncertain? Sure. Of course, it's the manure. Um, the, the urea, in fact, was manufactured, granulated from an absolutely uniform source, liquid source of material. So first of all, it was in a, a liquid environment. It uh, was absolutely uniform. And from that source, it was granulated out into the little, um, shall we call them particles or granules that are now in that bag. So we know exactly what's in that material. On the other hand, the manure pile may represent manure produced over um, a period of time. Some of it may be fresher than others. There may be parts of that pile that are actually um, waste from the animals and other parts that are bedding from the facility they were housed in. You know, the fact is, is that there's a lot of um, uh, heterogeneity in the manure pile, whereas we have virtually no heterogeneity in the bag of urea. All right, so I'm going to say that our urea is what I'll call a simple source. It's very, uh, it's very pure. It's very uniform, and in fact, our manure is a very complex source of nutrients and material. And I want us to drill down a little deeper into where that complexity actually comes from. First of all, we need to understand the manure, just the manure, and I'm not talking about the bedding yet. The manure itself is a mixture of what I'll call the metabolic waste, the waste that was generated by our biological system, as well as the solid waste that made it through the digestive system. Now, the metabolic waste is what in humans would be excreted by your kidneys and show up in our urine. That is metabolic waste, stuff that our body can't use, it was broken down, changed into a soluble form, and that we're excreting in our urine. So there's some of that, of course, in this animal waste. In the case of mammals, including ourselves, we excrete our nitrogen in the form of urea. And in the case of birds, they excrete the excess nitrogen in the form of uric acid, which is a little bit more complicated a molecule than urea. Then there's the, the feces. And feces itself is a mixture of things. There will be foods that were not digested. There will be microbodies from that array of creatures that live in the gut of the animal, um, assisting in the breakdown of the food. And there's also cell wall debris that kind of gets scraped off as everything's moving through the small intestine, uh, the large intestines. So the feces itself is quite a mixture of materials, each of which has uh, different properties in terms of what's in it and what its inherent availability might be. So if we look at this from a little bit more chemical point of view as opposed to where it originated from, 
we can see that urea does have some soluble material in it. And this is the stuff that comes out um, of, of our urine because that is excreted in a soluble form. It might also have uh, ammonium in that was produced as a first breakdown product of that urea once the manure was released into the environment. There's also going to be some organic molecules that are what I'll call labile. Uh, that means they break down relatively quickly when they're released into the environment and added to a soil. There'll be some materials in that manure which will be quite stable and might take a considerable time to actually break down into an available form. And by considerable, I mean months to perhaps years. And then in many modern animal diets, there are also inorganic mineral supplements um, included in the feed. And in, um, in a number of cases where people have actually looked at manure composition in a very fine scale, they've actually found some of these mineral particles making it through the animal's gut and being present in the manure itself. Now, that doesn't sound like a particularly exciting master's thesis, but there, was, there have been um, at least two that I know of, or, or advanced degree dissertations or thesis, where people actually separated out the components of manure and, and identified some of these mineral forms and, in fact, identified them back, traced them back to the source in the feed. So the stuff in the manure exists on an array of availabilities, that is, um, an array of the amount of time it might take for that stuff to become changed into a form where the plants can take it up, with the soluble material, of course, uh, being quite uh, readily available or very soon to be in an available form, like the urea. All right. So we know quite a bit of about the variability of manure. We know that chemically it's quite different. We know that it originated from different, um, in different ways from the animal system. But when we get our manure analysis, this is what the information is, is that's provided to us. And this is um, kind of the traditional manure analysis in the Mid-Atlantic based on um, what the labs provide to us, uh, on our, based on our communication with them about what's needed. We, in fact, are going to know that the uh, total nitrogen, um, the ammonium nitrogen, the um, phosphate, P2O5, the potash, and the moisture. And this analysis actually represents the bare minimum one needs in Maryland to generate um, information about the plant available nitrogen and the phosphorus and the potassium that should be uh, taken into account when you're doing the plan. Right? There are some labs that, for example, do not give ammonium nitrogen information because in the area in, that they traditionally serve, people haven't necessarily wanted that information. In Maryland, we need that information because it's part of our protocol for calculating plant available nitrogen. Okay, so manure is uh, quite variable from one farm to the other and perhaps from season to season over the same farm. And just to get a sense of that and, and why the use of um, some average analysis someone looked up in a book might not be a great idea, I've show, I'm showing you here the data, uh, the average minimum and maximum for nitrogen, ammonium, phosphate, and potash for some recent samples. Uh, this was calculated from 204 samples that were used in nutrient management plan development by extension advisors, but during fiscal year 8, 9, 10, and 11. So it's very recent information. And you can see that uh, although we have an average of 0.78% nitrogen in the solid dairy manures that we use for plant development, there's an incredibly wide range of possible values that were actually used based on an actual manure analysis that was supplied for the development of this plan. Very, very little nitrogen was found, 0.04% nitrogen was found in one sample, and as high as 2.67% percent nitrogen was found in another. Now, in case you find that a little disturbing, I want to show you that we have very similar range of differences between the min and the max compared to the average for ammonium. We have a similar wide range in phosphate, and we have a, an incredibly wide range in the potash. 
And the reason why manure analysis is uh, emphasized and required uh, as a basis for developing a nutrient management plan is because we simply can't rely upon book values. Uh, we need to actually get uh, a good representative sample of the material that our producer is going to use so we know where they fall within this possible continuum. And if you want to compare this table to an older table that we've got, you'll see similar differences. Uh, it's probably no worse, but it certainly uh, it hasn't appeared to get any better over time either in terms of the possible range of values that's out there for nutrient composition of, of a particular manure type. All right. So um, I want a little uh, thinking on your part here. Why is there all that variability in a solid dairy manure? After all, they're all dairy animals. Uh, it's all within a rather narrow window of time. Give me at least one reason why we might be seeing this kind of variability. And I know this is going to take a couple words here or a sentence, so I'll give you a little bit of time to respond. How can this amount of variability actually be observed? Why are we seeing it? Oh, fantastic. Getting wonderful answers. You're right. Just because someone's in dairy farming doesn't mean that they're feeding exactly the same diet as anybody else. Hopefully, dairy farmers are looking at uh, the composition of their components and making a nice balanced diet. They may be even be getting advice from someone else on this. Maybe they're using book values for what's in the feed, or maybe they're actually getting some analysis. Uh, either way, there's a lot of difference in terms of how those animals are being fed. Of course, there's different amounts and different kinds of bedding involved. That's true. There's a wide array of storage conditions. Maybe some of the manure is being stored outside. Uh, it's being rained on. Maybe some of the manure is being stored in some kind of an environment where it's not being rained on. So there's a wide array of reasons why we might find the differences. I know that some of you mentioned poor sampling. Of course, we have no idea when we see this kind of data whether poor sampling is involved. And I hope all of you know how to take a good manure sample and are providing that information to your clients if, in fact, your clients are taking those samples. And I want to remind you that we have a manure sampling bulletin on our website. And uh, you should be providing that to folks if, in fact, they're taking their own samples. And I would certainly chat with them, do some what we'll call active listening to see whether they're really incorporating those principles into their sample collection if, in fact, you're relying upon their collecting it. But yes, I hope that's not a reason, poor sampling techniques. But I have my suspicions when I look at some of those values, both the high and the low, that that could be part of, uh, that could be the reason why some of these values vary. But even beyond that, even assuming the samples were taken correctly, we're still going to see some variability within an animal group due to all those other things we mentioned. Differences in feed, differences in storage condition, differences in the uh, length of storage time, and the amount and time, uh, the amount and type of bedding. OK, so first we're going to talk about uh, manure sampling because it is so very important. We want to know what's in the manure that this particular client is going to use. And we want to collect a representative sample as close to the time as utilization is as practical. Now, representative means that it represents that pile of manure um, to the greatest extent possible, realizing that the pile itself or the, or the amount of manure itself may not be perfectly uniform either. So. Um, we're going to collect a sample uh, that hopefully represents uh, fairly closely uh, uh, the material that the person's going to put out. That as close to the time as utilization is, as is practical is important. Uh, we realize that 
manure will continue to undergo some changes uh, with time, and we want to minimize that time and, and the opportunity that goes along with it for further changes. So if we're talking about manure that's being applied on a spring crop, perhaps it's being applied in March, April, May, uh, what I'm telling people now, and no one at MDA has disagreed with me vociferously, is that we need to look at sampling our manure um, in, in the uh, what I'll call early winter so that there's time to get the information back from the lab, time to get that information to your planner, time for the planner to get it into the queue for plan development. I like to think that the time period between about Thanksgiving and New Year's is a good time. Um, I might get it on people's holiday schedule. They could get their information back from the lab, even if they send it in first week in January within a couple weeks. It's before the huge crunch most labs experience, and there's still time to get that information to your planner and for them to develop that plan uh, before you want to get out there and actually, before your producer wants to get out there and actually apply manure. Now, just as a means of review, and this is information that is taken from our publication on manure sampling, if we just look at the solid uh, manure, and, and that publication also talks about liquid, but uh, I'm trying to fit a lot into an hour here, um, you have to collect a number of samples. Uh, remember, just like a field is heterogeneous, um, a, a pile or areas or um, a lagoon or a pile or storage area of manure is also heterogeneous. And the best way to, to get a representative sample is to collect a lot of samples so that once you mix them together, together and get them analyzed, they have a better chance of actually representing the material that you have. So I rep recommend a minimum of 10, uh, and actually I would go towards 15 if it were my operation, of samples um, from the manure storage. Right. If bedding is involved, you want to include bedding in the manure sample to the same extent that it is in the source. You do want to avoid any untypical components, and that's a big player in manure that's been stored outside and might actually have a crust on it. Uh, you, if that is, in fact, the case, you want to avoid the crust because it is probably not typical in composition of the rest of the uh, pile. And your whole goal is actually to get what we'll call a composite sample, a sample that's been taken from many places in the pile. Right. From there, you want to mix that composite extremely well. Uh, if you are mixing it in the same mixer that you use for soil, you want to be sure that you mix, uh, clean it out well after that. But you want to mix that manure very, very well. And then you're actually going to take a subsample of that composite and send that subsample off to the lab. Be sure that you package it carefully. Um, we recommend double bagging and Ziploc bags for solid manure so that um, the material will arrive in the lab still in packaging. And if you have more than one, packages aren't breached and you don't get mixing. Right. Now, the manure analysis is a wonderful first step. We should be very careful in how the manure is sampled. We should follow the principles of excluding untypical materials. We should take a lot of samples. We should get a good composite that we mix well. And from that, we'll get our manure analysis. But we hopefully, we all know by now that, um, that not all the nitrogen in that manure is going to be plant available the year of application. Um, depending upon where you are in the country, there are different protocols or equations that are used to estimate the plant available nitrogen, and I'm going to go over our equations for that in just a moment. I will say that most of the research points to the fact that the phosphorus and the potassium in raw manures are, in fact, plant available. So pound per pound, uh, the phosphorus in manure, raw manures, is equivalent to the um, phosphorus you'd get in a commercial fertilizer. Several uh, studies in different places in the country have supported that idea. All right. So how do we figure out what the plant available nitrogen of a manure is? Well, the protocol we've used in Maryland for a number of years is this. Our plant available nitrogen is the sum of our available ammonium plus the available organic. All right. So it's available ammonium plus available organic. 
our available ammonium is the ammonium in the manure sample times the ammonium conservation factor. And you know that we tend to like these nice little equations. And another way of saying this is ammonium nitrogen times conservation factor, or ammonium nitrogen times F-con. That will tell us what the available ammonium is of the total ammonium that was um, found in the sample when it reached the lab. So the second half of this is the available nitrogen. How do we calculate available nitrogen? Well, available nitrogen is the organic nitrogen times the mineralization factor. Or using our neat little equations, it's N org times F min. Now, who can tell me how we get organic nitrogen? Because it wasn't on the manure analysis. Right. Thank you, Krista. It's the uh, total nitrogen minus the ammonium. What is an ammonium is considered to be organic. Thank you. All right. So here I put it up in a formula. Um, I tend to think of things in formulas. They're nice shorthands. That's why we use them. So again, just to reiterate things, plant available nitrogen is the ammonium nitrogen times the F, uh, conservation factor, F-con, plus the organic nitrogen times the mineralization factor. So let's talk about where these different factors here come from, F-con and F-min. First of all, the mineralization factor. The mineralization factor we use in our plans is a published average value from research. And we'll look at a table in a moment, but this depends upon the animal type. Animals are fed differently based on the kind of digestive system they have and the um, ability or the propensity for that material to break down when it reaches the soil environment is quite dependent upon the animal type because of that type of digestive system and the way they are fed. Right? But we use published average values. The ammonium conservation factor is, uh, is research-based and has been published. And this depends upon the typical incorporation practices that your producer is going to follow. How long is this material left on the soil surface where ammonia can escape into the environment? Essentially, the shorter the time it's left on the surface, the less opportunity that, that there is for that volatilization to occur. All right. So here's an abbreviated table of mineralization rates. This is also found in the regulations, and it's found on our website. And you can see that depending upon animal type, and we're only looking at three here, uh, cattle, be it uh, beef or dairy, layers, uh, layered poultry, and horses. But you can see that the amount of nitrogen expressed as a decimal fraction that's going to break down from manure the year of application varies. Uh, with cattle, it's about 0.35 or 35%. With layers, it's 60%. With horses, it's 20%. This represents a, different in di a difference in diets and in digestive systems. Right? We can also see that um, this sort of carries through as you go along in time. Um, there's a certain amount of that organic nitrogen is going to break down the year after application uh, and for a year after that. After two years, the amount that's uh, broken down is so small that it kind of blends into what's happening with the total organic matter mass in your soil, and it's very hard to separate out any more of a credit after two years in our climate. I will mention that there are states where the um, nitrogen credit goes on longer than two years, but there are also places that have a shorter warm season and a much colder winter than we have here. Now, in terms of our conservation factors, these were revised, I think it's about five years ago now, and uh, they're broken out into three tables, one for liquid manure, one for poultry, and one for other solid manures. And this is the one that I put up here, the other solid manures. And you can see that we now discriminate between whether things are, are being tilled in by conventional tillage, by conservation tillage, in term, and also look at uh, how long that material is left on the surface before it is incorporated into the soil. If, in fact, you are in a no-till situation, you're only going to conserve about 35 percent or 0.35, de expressed as a decimal fraction of your ammonium that was uh, reported in your analysis. 
compared to uh, conventional tillage within an hour where you can conserve darn close to 100% or 96%. Okay, so is there any uncertainty in those two factors that we used? All right. First of all, we use uh, published mineralization factors, and those are um, averages. We need to understand that the actual mineralization rate may vary due to the composition of the particular manure your operator has, uh, the soil on which he is applying it, and the weather conditions that season. So that's a whole lot of sources of possibilities there. The ammonia conservation factor um, also has some uncertainty with it, but it's actually less than the mineralization factor. Uh, if, in fact, you get a rainfall event sooner than what you predicted in your calculation for available ammonium, for example, let's say your producer's in a no-till situation, so you used a 0.35 for your FCON, but in fact it rained the day after the manure was applied, um, all of that um, ammonium that remained at that point in time was washed into the soil. So in fact there's going to be more nitrogen in the system than you would have predicted. Um, and that's where the variability in the ammonia conservation factor typically comes from. So we're going to go back and look at this first issue. Uh, what kind of variability do we see in mineralization rates? <laughs> and um, to tell you the truth, as disheartening as this is to me, it is phenomenal. Right? So let's look within um, animal types. Um, I like the Delaware study because Delaware is close and people tend to feel some uh, kinship with the results that um, are found in their research. There was a very, very uh, well-designed study done in Delaware a um, number of years ago now, 20 litters. These were actually from commercial boiler houses, not from some little experimental setup. And these litters were incubated in the same soil under very controlled conditions. So that means the breakdown occurred, uh, the differences in the breakdown occurred as a function of the litters, not because one season was warmer and one was colder or not because there were any soil differences, because these litters were mixed into the same soil um, and were kept under controlled conditions where all of the little containers uh, had the same, um, were in the same chamber with the same moisture and um, temperature conditions. And what they found in Delaware was that the um, average amount of organic nitrogen that broke down the year of application was 66%. Now that's good because that's even higher than what we use for broilers, but they also found that the values ranged from a low of 21% to a high of 100%. I will say that they looked at a lot of other characteristics of the litter to see if there was some quick test that could be done to kind of predict which manures might mineralize better than others. They looked at carbon nitrogen ratio and some other chemical extractants that they thought might be useful. And I've got to tell you that nothing jumped out at them as a, a good quick indicator of uh, inherent potential mineralization. Um, so unfortunately, uh, we were left with uh, what I'll call ambiguity or uncertainty, but not a reason for it and not anything we could explore um, further. A similar study was done much more recently by folks at USDA here in Beltsville, but they collected samples uh, from here up to Maine from dairy farms, actually 107 dairy manures, and uh, they found that their mineralization um, ranged from 0 to 55 percent, when in fact the average mineralization rate of um, cattle um, is 35 percent. So I just want to impress upon you that these materials uh, are quite variable, um, not only in terms of composition, which we can look at quite easily in a table like I showed you earlier, but they also have tremendous variability in terms of how they behave when you act them to add them to the soil, particularly in reference to how much nitrogen would be released that first season. Now a study in Georgia, and they, they did one where they looked at a lot of litters, but they also did one where they looked at one litter in nine soils, and these were nine soils that were typical of the part of the state where manure had been was being used, and again, they looked at this under controlled conditions, so the temperature uh, was the same and, and the moisture content of the 
uh, soil manure system was kept the same. They found an average mineralization rate of 62 percent. So we're kind of converging on this 50, 60 percent as an average. They found a little bit tighter range um, across soils than a Delaware found uh, across manures. But they did find that the range for these um, over these nine soils was as low as about 40 and as high as 80. So again, we're getting variability due to soil differences. And they found that the uh, sandy loam soils had a higher mineralization rate, or the loamy sands had a higher mineralization rate than the sandy loams, and the sandy loams had a higher mineralization rate than the clays. OK, so I want to really stretch you now. I want to ask you what soil characteristics might be responsible for a higher mineralization rate of a particular manure in a loamy sand soil than in a clay soil. So I'll give you a, a minute or so to uh, respond to that. Good, we're getting some great answers here. Uh, the fact is that this mineralization uh, in, in our typical agricultural soils is being carried on by aerobic organisms. And they need oxygen. So those of you that said aeration status are right on. Those of you that said um, pore space are right on because obviously aeration is close aeration status is closely tied to pore space and texture if you have a loamy sand soil it's going to have a lot of large pores as the microbes use up the oxygen in breaking down the um, organic nitrogen they're going to be releasing carbon dioxide and in a soil that has more large pores like a loamy sand uh, that exchange of that excess carbon dioxide and the um, resupply of the oxygen into those pores is going to be uh, much, um, much more rapid. And so oxygen is never going to limit the breakdown as it might in, in a soil that had a heavier texture. So thanks so much for your comments on that. We're right on here. Okay, so, and what about the weather? Um, the fact is, is that uh, the microbes uh, crank right down if it gets uh, cooler. And we certainly do have some springs that are cooler or warmer than others. Um, the, pri the primary um, groups of organisms that are involved in this breakdown, again, as I said, are, are aerobic. So if we have a wet spring and the soil actually gets uh, waterlogged, and again, um, aeration isn't rapid, or your carbon dioxide isn't escaping and your oxygen isn't getting in the soil as fast as it could under other conditions because so many of the pores are filled with water, things are going to break down slower. And also, if your soil dries out too much, if we have a very, very dry spring, we might find that um, we have a slower mineralization rate. So there's so far, we know that there, our material itself uh, is variable, and we hope we've got a good sample and are basing everything on that, but we're never 100% sure unless we took the sample ourselves. Um, and the rate at which the nitrogen breaks down um, is, is going to vary depending upon the material itself, the soil it's mixed into, the characteristics of that soil, and then top that all off with the fact that spring seasons are different from year to year, and the environmental conditions themselves, the amount of temperature, the amount of moisture, and the temperature is going to uh, vary from year to year. 
There's some excellent data to show that breakdown of organic nitrogen it can be quite well predicted by growing degree days. But of course, that's something you know as the season's going on, not when you're doing the plan ahead of time. So knowing that kind of explains things after the fact. But it doesn't help us be any better at predicting what's going to happen to a manure in any particular season. OK, so this is a pitch for um, in-season monitoring of nitrogen in manured fields. If uh, you hope your manure analysis is representative, but you're not 100% sure, and you know that the mineralization rate is an average, but can actually vary widely from that average, and you know that there's variability from season to season based uh, on how much moisture uh, we get and what our, our temperature regimes are, it certainly makes sense to use in-season tests to determine nitrogen status if there's one out there. And in fact, in Maryland and in the Northeast, there is a test for corn, and it's called the pre dress nitrate test. So to my way of thinking, um, folks should run PSNT um, if they meet the conditions for that test on at least some of their representative fields that are getting manured every year to pick up that season-to-season -season variability um, that there really is no other way to capture along with the, the uh, differences that might have been introduced in, in what's in that field based on the manure uh, analysis um, and um, and the soil in which it's being um, utilized. And then there's this whole other issue of, am I sure the rate I recommended was actually applied and applied uniformly across the field? So I'm going to switch gears here and now talk about how important it is for a producer to know how much manure is actually going out. And the only way we could know that is to measure what's going out. And if it's not the amount that uh, is being recommended to alter the settings or something on your application strategy so that uh, you're um, getting closer to the recommended amount than you might be now. And that's another way of saying calibration is essential. I'd like to assume that every producer out there wants to know what their spreader is putting out and that they also would like to put out as uniform a rate as possible. So I'm going to harp on those two things over the next few moments. First of all, there's a, a number of different kinds of manure spreaders, and I'm going to limit my discussion today to rear discharge spreaders. And I'm also going to use the weight area method in the example. There are other methods, and uh, we'll look at the references for those in a few minutes. But the conversation we have right now will be limited to these two conditions, rear discharge spreaders and the use of the uh, weight area method. So how does the weight area method look? Well, you collect manure on a small portion of the field, and you project that application rate um, on a per acre basis. And your small area in a field might be a tarp or a, pl a cl plastic sheet or some other collection surface. And this is a very good method for many manure types. Right. Um, I don't want to get into the discussion today of whether it's good for poultry, because there's a there's a lot of polarization on that thought. Uh, I have some people whose word I respect tell me that this doesn't work at all for poultry litter, because the litter just slides right off the sheets. And I have other people say it works perfectly fine. So um, try it and see what you think. Um, but um, I don't have as wide an experience with that as I do other manures. And um, I'm not going to get into that discussion. I'm just going to know that there's a difference of opinion. So. What about uniformity across the, the, the spread width? You know, for example, do you know whether or not your applicator, um, your manure spreader, applies uniformly across the distance where the manure reaches the soil? Um, do you know if any manure gets spread to the side of the equipment? So we're going to look at some, uh, some data that I and others have collected to address these issues. First of all, in my uh, zeal to understand manure calibration better so we could write that series of pubs we did a couple years ago, over a, a good five years, um, we calibrated a number of spreaders. And um, 
tried to get a sense of what the capability of the different machines was. And this is an instance where we were actually applying a composted manure uh, with a um, with a box spreader. And this composted manure had a very, very nice consistency for spreading. That is, it was friable. It didn't have any big clumps in it. It had a nice moisture that was going to um, spread quite well, much better than what you might find in some of these clumpy, wetter manures that are put out with box spreaders. This is pretty close to an ideal situation for determining what the inherent variability is behind a typical box spreader. Right? And what I did so I could collect more experimental units or gather more data was to actually spread the width behind the spreader into two equal parts, the part from the middle to the right and the part from the middle to the left. Right? So I got two numbers. For example, in one case, um, we got 15 tons per acre rate on this on the left side and the other side right. And farther down the field where we had stuff spread out, we got 16 on the left side and 19 on the right side. And farther down the field even more, we got 24 on the left side and 26 on the right side. So a reason for doing this is you want to know whether there's any non-uniformity across your spreader. That could indicate that something's clogged. Uh, even though you've checked it visually, you couldn't see it. This probably isn't too bad. Right. So across those three different um, distances across the field, you can see that we got an average of 18 tons in one location, 17 and a half in another, and 25 in the third. Average those together, and it's a 20 ton per acre rate. Not bad, but the fact is that uh, the actual numbers that went into that average were um, 25 to 30 percent off from the average. Right. So we need to understand that. Our variability uh, across the field, even if we're right behind the piece of equipment, we're, uh, we're measuring it right behind the piece of equipment where it should be the best and the most uniform, there's still variability. Um, manure spreaders in this country have not been designed for uniform application. And that's something that the manufacturers themselves have basically said. There are some pieces of equipment coming out of Germany that are much better. Um, but the, the ones produced in this country um, don't have a goal of, of uniform spreading, quite frankly. And I think this is a real difference from fertilizer um, application equipment, where there's much more um, emphasis on that. Okay. Then we've got the whole issue of, is there any lateral spread? Is everything going out right behind the spreader, or is there stuff being spread to the side? Okay. And again, we've looked at that in far more detail than I ever want to admit. And uh, what we found is that uh, in many circumstances, at least 75% uh, of the material is spread directly behind the spreader in some box spreaders. Um, we've even found it to be higher than that. Right. On the other hand, if you start talking about spinner spreaders, only um, a, a relatively uh, cons small amount of the material is actually directly behind the spreader. And there's a tremendous amount of that material that's spread laterally or to the side. And that comes into uh, play when we um, try to try to figure out a way of co uh, coming up with a process, a protocol, a calculation, et cetera, that will assist us in determining how we should come back and do our next pass if, in fact, we want uniform application. And I'm going to assume we do. Okay. So here's a graph. This is out of a, a publication from Georgia. And they were looking at spreader distribution patterns. And this is from the center. This is from the, you know, the center tire, uh, the center of the spreader. And they got about three tons directly behind and an average of um, eight feet on either side. They got pretty close to two and a half tons. And an average of 16 feet on either side, they were down to one ton. So this is a poultry litter. Uh, this is probably a spinner spreader, although they didn't say in their publication. And you can see that there's some pretty significant, um, pretty significant quantities that are being spread uh, laterally. Here's an example of a piece of equipment that has a much tighter spread pattern. This is a box spreader. You can see that a huge portion of it's directly behind with very small amounts of it that are spread laterally. Not insignificant amounts, just smaller amounts. All right. Now here's a, a beautiful graph from Iowa State where they were looking at spread patterns and how to, uh, how to um, compensate for them to get uniform application. So they went to great detail to show of um, the distribution from very far to the right and to the left, OK? 
okay, about eight feet each way. And uh, this is what you get if you look at the one spreader path. Again, um, very high rate or much higher rate, approaching 15 to 16 tons per acre directly behind the spreader, but you're still getting some um, considerable distances out. Okay, so first they did um, three passes and they looked at the at a um, at a 12 foot spacing between passes that is from the center of one pass to the center of the other pass it's a 12 it was 12 feet and in fact you can see that if you do that you get a very very uneven distribution you get the highs of the 15 to 16 tons per acre um, in some parts of the field and you're down um, even where where there's manure application on both sides down in the three to four ton range in some parts of that field. And again, I'm going to assume that this is not acceptable to producers, that if they're relying upon that manure for a significant uh, portion of the nitrogen for that crop, that this is, this is not going to be okay for them, that they want a better shot at this. Right. So here's an example, um, same equipment, same situation, same pub, as a matter of fact, where they did passes six feet apart. And you can see that although the actual rate um, bounces around a bit with um, across the field after the passes have been made, that um, it's a whole lot better than it was when we were 12 foot apart. And if you take away the edge effect of both sides, you can see that the rate we're talking about here is about 21 to 25. And if I had to average it, I'd say it's somewhere about 21, 22 uh, tons of manure per acre. All right. Again, some variability, um, but I think it's probably the best we're going to do. All right, so I want to look, I want to call your uh, attention here to two things. First of all, when you look at the maximum rate when there's only one pass, as we have here, you've probably got an average that's in the neighborhood of 15 tons of manure per acre, whereas when you look down here, excluding the edge effect, uh, you get an average that's closer to 21 or 22 tons per acre. I'd like um, I'd like you to hazard a guess as to why the rate is higher here than it is here. And I'll give you a minute or so to come up with some reasons. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. It's that side thrown manure that we're capturing here that we did not capture here. And the point I want to make is there's a pretty significant difference between the 15 tons we get here and the 21 or 22 we get down here. And that's why when you're doing the weight area method with a box spreader, you really need to be careful of where you place your surfaces so that you get what I call the side throw or the laterally thrown manure. We're going to emphasize that again in some of the slides coming up. Okay? So there's there's a concept called effective swath width, and I like it because it's 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 pretty precise. Conceptually, it's the distance between the center point of one pass of a spreader and the center point of the next pass. So I know exactly what I mean by it. Arithmetically, it's the sum of the distance on each side of the center line of the tractor and the spreader path where the application rate is 50% of the maximum application rate. So I understand what it is in the first definition, and I know how to calculate it in the second definition. OK, so how do we deal with this lateral application? Well, if we're dealing with a box spreader, where the spread pattern is what I call tight, that is, most of it's right behind with maybe only oh, somewhere between 10 and 25% of the sides. The effect of swath width is essentially the width of the spreader. But you have to be very careful where you put your collection surfaces so you get the lateral throw from each side. Spinner spreaders, you've got to look 
at the uh, effective swath width because the spread pattern is wide and it's going to vary depending upon the material you've got and the moisture content. And I would be very cautious about um, extrapolating from one year to the other without checking it first. In this case, you actually have to determine the effective swath width. So I'm going to um, talk to you about how you do that in a moment. First of all, we'll deal with the easier situation. Box spreaders, tight spread pattern, right? Most of the manure goes out the back. Some goes to the side. However, if we place our um, collection surfaces in the right place, we can co compensate or get that side throw. So I like five um, collection surfaces because Remember, there's variability, and I want enough numbers that when I average them, I've got a decent average. Remember the variability I saw directly behind that box spreader, even when I was using a friable compost? Well, in any case where there's a possibility of a lot of variability, you get a better average with more measurements. So I'm going to insist on five, a minimum of five measurements, five plastic sheets. You want them perpendicular to the uh, direction of spreading. Oh, you want them parallel to the direction of spreading. You want to position those sheets so that you, um, they're on the second pass, OK? This is the first pass. This is the second pass. This is the third pass, OK? You want to position them on the second pass, and you want to weigh them after the third pass, OK? That way, you'll get the lateral throw on both sides. Okay. You want to, of course, observe your effective swath width. In this case, it was the width of the spreader. Then you want to collect and weigh the manure on each sheet and average that quantity and project it to tons per acre. Let's go back to that other one. It's critical that these be put in the right place. If you put them on the second pass, in the center of the second pass, and you collect them after the third pass, you will have caught the side throw manure from each of the passes to the left and to the right. And as we just saw, that can be the difference between getting a 15 ton per acre rate and a 21 or 22 ton per acre rate. It's not insignificant. OK, what about those situations where we've got a spinner spreader? Well, in that case, we know we've got a lot of lateral throw. Uh, you actually need to have collection surfaces uh, out, set out considerable distances to the left and to the right. All right. You want to run your spreader. In this case, it was discharged in place. I like that because I know what I need to do in terms of uh, um, effective swap with before you get revved up and go out to the field. Right? You need to collect the amount of manure that's on each of these. You want to know exactly what your distance is between each of these and the center. Okay, And then you're going to actually calculate the effective swap width. First of all, what was the maximum rate? That should be towards the center. And you want to go out. You want to be able to extrapolate out to the distance from the center where you reached 1 half or 50% of your maximum um, rate. And your effective swath width is the sum of the distance from the center to the left and from the center to the right. That's the distance you should have between this path and the next path to get as uniform an application as is possible called effective swath width. Okay. So arithmetically, okay, we know what it is conceptually, but arithmetically, the effective swath width is the sum of the distance on each side of the center line of the tractor and the spreader path where the application rate is 50% of the maximum rate. Now, there are a lot of publications out there that tell you what size tarp you should use and what the rate is, depending upon the tarp size. But I think there's two things you need to take into account when you um, are trying to decide whether you're going to make your collection surfaces 10 by 10 or 5 by 5 or 6 by 6 or whatever it is. You don't want the weight that you're lifting so heavy that it damages you to lift it. And I hope you're all lifting with your legs and not your back anyway. But you don't want it. You don't want the weight there so light that you can't measure your material accurately. And I have to tell you, based on my experience with uh, those spring scales, those hanging spring scales, is that they are worthless below a pound. There is so much variability um, between hanging balances and, and even within the same balance from measurement to measurement that I wouldn't rely upon them for anything less than a pound. 
right? I will tell you that if this works for you and for the material you're calibrating for, that a 56 inch by 56 inch is one two thousandth of an acre. And so the weight in your tarp in, in pounds is actually equivalent to the tons per acre rate. So that's nice if, in fact, it's not so much it, it damages you to lift it, and there's enough on the tarp that you can actually get an accurate measurement with the weighing equipment you're using. So take those things into account. OK, in case uh, you haven't looked at these recently or perhaps aren't aware of them at all, all of the extension people should know about them. We did a series of calibration pubs a couple years ago after many, many years of um, messing around with real equipment and taking out versions and seeing how people understood it, uh, of calibration pubs. We have one where we talk about uniformity and spread patterns and determining effective swath width. Uh, we have one where we talk about using the weight area method. We have one for liquid spreaders where you use the load area method, and that's actually the best method for liquid spreaders, but you still need to know your effective swath width. We have one where uh, it's a load area method when you have the ability to weigh the load either with drive-on scales or perhaps a farm scale. And we have the last one where you use the load area method, but you're estimating the density um, of the material based on what you get in a bucket and extrapolate that to the weight of the load. Um, so all of these are available on our website. All of these are available from our office if you want original pubs. And uh, I recommend that if folks are calibrating their own equipment, if some of your clients are calibrating their own equipment, and that's often the case, that we include copies of the appropriate ones of these in their plans. Um, every single one of these has the step-by-step -step of what you need to do, the worksheets that are there, any documentation that any inspector would need as to how your equipment was calibrated and what rate you actually got. One of the reasons we put these out there was not only so that things would be uh, excruciatingly clear, but so that folks did have the documentation of what rate they were applying when an inspector came and asked them how they got the number that was in their plan or in their records. All right. Now, I'm not going to tell you that determining effective swath width and calibration doesn't take some time, because it does. It probably takes, I would think, a minimum of an hour, maybe a little more. But um, I believe that it's worth doing it if you want a uniform application rate um, of, a, of a certain value. Right. You're not going to have uniformity unless you take some precautions. And you're not knowing what you're putting out unless you're measuring it. And calibration um, will um, assist you in doing that. All right. So just to kind of sum things up, where is the uncertainty? Well, what's the actual content of the manure? Um, does my manure analysis reflect it pretty closely? Does it not? You're not going to know. How much manure will be released this year? Um, you're not going to know that either. You're just going to know that it could be significantly more or significantly less than what was assumed in the plan. And is the recommended rate actually being applied in a uniform manner? You can actually be more sure of this than you can of the other two if you've determined the effective swath width or are using the effective swath width for box spreaders and if you've calibrated. You can actually be more sure of this than you can of this. All right? If you've taken the sample yourself, you're probably quite sure of this too. So how do we deal with the variable nature of manure? We obtain a representative sample um, as close to time of application as possible. Um, how, do, how can we possibly deal with this variability and release rate of nitrogen from manure? Well, if you're dealing with a crop that has an in-season technique for confirming it, like we do for corn, it should be used. How can we deal with the um, application rate uncertainty? We can. Uh,